I'd like to move on to uh, my next question. And um, you know, first I'll direct this to uh, to Margaret uh, and uh, Stephen. Please feel free to to join in as well. Um, so I wanted to shift some attention. Uh, we we talked a lot today about the what, which is great. I think uh, you know, often in these uh, sessions. Uh, we don't get to the tangible things of what we should be doing, but I think all of you uh, produced a lot of, uh, of interesting examples of what Canada could be doing uh, in the coming years. Now I'd like to focus a little bit on the how. So, um, you know, we, we touched around a few of the, the multilateral uh, four that Canada has been traditionally engaged in, you know, whether it's APEC, uh, previous webinars talked about the Asian Development Bank. Uh, obviously, we're a, a founding dialogue partner of ASEAN, region, ASEAN and the ASEAN Regional Forum. Um, but there are new groupings uh, um, or re-emerging um, re groupings uh, in this region. And one of them uh, that I'd like to talk about is the Quad. And I, and I think, uh, Margaret, you referenced this before, uh, US, Japan, uh, India, and Australia uh, now have, uh, have re-emerged uh, their quadrilateral dialogue relationship. Um, and have had their first ever leader summit earlier this month. Um, do you think there's, you, you hinted that you think there's a role there for Canada in, in maybe a quad plus uh, framework. I wonder if you can kind of you know, discuss that a little bit more and, and what you had in mind and whether you thought the other players would, uh, would seek out a Canadian role, whether we could have some sort of unique um, uh, sort of perspective there uh, for the other quad countries. Right. And uh, yes, indeed, I think that we uh, could have a tremendous potential role. We've been uh, participating in, in a complementary way, I would say, to some of the military exercises in the region. And that's been important just to have a presence, particularly when it comes to Taiwan. And uh, in addition, the Quad has set up a technology network. And that's a, a, an opportunity for Canada. We're already well integrated with the Department of Defense in the US with their technology development. And so I think it's something where Canadian companies could have a, a real positive uh, contribution. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Stephen. Uh, I, I have many, many different uh, ideas here in terms of how Canada can get more engaged. And I think the Quad is definitely one particular element, but the challenge with the Quad is the substance of what kind of activities it's engaged in. And I think that um, Canada is a big country, but we have limited resources. And I think that we need to really focus on what capabilities that we can bring to uh, the quad or a quad plus arrangement. So if we're thinking about it, uh, echoes what I said in my initial opening statements, Canada has, you know, a you know, decades long track record of working within NATO, with in terms of intelligence gathering operations, working with other partners, that kind of experience can be leveraged to work with other partners um, in a quad plus format or other kind of format um, within the South China Sea or the East China Sea or what we see right now within the uh, Sea of Japan in terms of monitoring um, the North Koreans so they're not uh, evading sa sanctions. It's really critical that we think about what is Canada's comparative advantages and how we can leverage those capabilities within an arrangement like the Quad or a Quad Plus. And I think that's something that we need to continue to think about. Um, second is diplomacy. And I think that we um, forget diplomacy, even though I think um, some of our colleagues on the call are diplomats. And I think um, Canada has led uh, most recently an international initiative to uh, push back against hostage diplomacy. And I think that this is another really critical area where Canada needs to work with um, like-minded countries to um, use its diplomatic good offices to forge you know, a broader consensus and, and, and coalitions that can use its diplomatic resources with its like-minded partners. So I think that there's the, the hard side, um, the, the, the technical side, the comparative advantages we can bring in terms of capabilities, but I think we should also be thinking about the soft side, the diplomatic side. Um, and these are both critical to having a footprint that's uh, consistent and brings value to the region. Thanks a lot, Stephen. I think that's uh, really well taken. And, um, you know, I think it brings up an important point that, um, and I should uh, remind our viewers too, that Stephen has uh, just written a very nice uh, op-ed, so if you want more information on this, I, I believe I might miss the title, but it's uh, what the quad is and, and what it is not, what it is and what it is not, which is really important because I think you know, one of the, the senses that I find often when hearing about the quad is it's largely framed in a very um, simplistic um, narrative that essentially this is a, 
uh, you know, four country alliance against China. The reality is that I think that grouping has evolved in quite some way. Um, and I think you can see that from the most recent leaders meeting, whether it's vaccine diplomacy, whether it's uh, economic and trade issues, uh, this is not just about um, and navies uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. I think there's more to the Quad and I think there will be more in the future of the Quad, which, which poses real opportunities for the Canadian side. My last point on this too, is I think that rather than necessarily wait to be asked to be, you know, the fifth member or the sixth, seventh, eighth member, you know, become a Pentagon or a, or another a more sided shape. Um, I think Canada should look at and, ha and have active discussions with the other four on, on you know, uh, observer sort of roles or, or ways on the fringes to have discussions about what the Quad's doing and how Canada could potentially be involved. It's not always black and white about being in or being out. I think there's, there's ways to have discussions and, and active sort of engagement with the Quad um, without feeling that it needs to be, uh, you know, a full-time member. So this is uh, something to, to, to uh, tease out a bit more later. Jonathan, um, just one point more, I think is really critical when we're thinking about Canadian engagement within the region is that, you know, and, and it goes back to my point, what does Indo-Pacific countries want of Canada? They want consistent principled engagement that is Canadian. So they don't want to see Canada as a junior partner of the United States. We should be very clear, the United States is a, our most important partner, but at the same time, we need to have uh, distinguished ourselves to be different and to at times have a different position on issues within the region. And that kind of consistent principled approach to diplomacy is something that I think many partners within the region um, would uh, look to uh, Canada for. I think that's a really important point is that it's not a, it's not only about the defense side, but the diplomacy is, is, is really important. And sometimes, you know, we'll get into the issue of resources later, which I think is a really crucial one that you started to bring up, but we're not always talking about uh, how many frigates or how many submarines are deployed into the region. I think that's a really um, a crucial element. And I actually think that Canadian Defense Department and the Canadian Navy has done a really good job in this sense. Um, but it's not just that, uh, you know, our strategy involves more than just defense. Uh, it's about diplomacy. It's about energy security, as Jeff has referenced. It's about uh, the private sector as well, as Rohan referenced. So it's a really good point. Um, so I'd like to move on, you know, and sort of connected to this question. And, and I think as we, we reference with the Quad uh, and with some of the challenges in this region, Stephen, you referenced Operation Neon, uh, our efforts uh, on the Korean Peninsula to ensure that North Korea isn't able to circumvent um, United Nations uh, uh, sanctions. Um, you know, China is an element of the challenges in this region, a large element, but it's not the exclusive element of challenges. Um, but on China, and, I, and I, you know, this is a particularly challenging uh, time right now in Canada's mm -hmm. relationship with China, how can countries in this region, how can Canada in tandem with some of its like-minded partners uh, work to sort of to, to shape or push can China uh, to be more in line uh, with the current rules-based order? Is this a, sort of a fanciful discussion that was something that we could have 10 years ago and uh, you know that we could potentially shape uh, Chinese norms, Chinese interests, so they'd be more aligned with international law, more aligned with current international institutions? Um, or do we have to default now to many lateral organizations um, and other such groupings? Is there is there any hope of, of, of shaping Chinese behavior uh, with, the, with the current existing architecture? So maybe I'll start with Stephen um, and, then, uh, and then Margaret, uh, if you don't mind. So I, th I think that when we're advocating or we're thinking about a free and open Indo-Pacific vision that includes Canada, this doesn't exclude pre-existing um, institutions such as APEC or other forums. It's something that's added onto that to provide extra um, support to the region. And I mentioned again in my opening remarks that the Indo-Pacific region is actually very underdeveloped in terms of rules. And I think when you look at ASEAN and ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus six, the consensus-based decision-making um, institutions. What that means is that everybody has to agree for something to happen rather than rules-based um, um, uh, rules based organizations. And this will limit its development. So I think that when we're thinking about the region and we're thinking about how we can fit Canada or uh, China into the region and encourage China to be in a different direction, we have to create a positive institution that will be attractive to China. That probably needs to be economically dynamic, something that um, is very integrated, uh, both diplomatically and politically, that shares values. 
Um, and these would gradually, I think, pull China in a slightly different direction. And I think that's really critical. If you create a critical mass of countries with shared understanding of rules-based order, that are focusing on free and open concepts, um, that are building shared institutions, China will want to be part of that. If they want to be part of that, they're going to adopt some or all of those rules. And I think that's kind of the way to move forward. Okay, thanks. Uh, Margaret, really quickly, what, what's your thoughts on this? Well, I, I see the attractiveness of that approach in principle. Uh, I think that China, though, would, would want to run whatever multilateral organization, as you've just described. I think it was interesting to see the interventions in Alaska at the uh, meeting that Blinken had with Wang Yi. Um, and there he put forward a very strong first step. Um, the other person who was there was Kurt Campbell. And he and I were both on a panel on December 9th, um, on the subject of the D10, uh, run, a panel run by the governments of the D10. And he said a number of things that, there that are interesting in the context of the um, Indo-Pacific. He said that, um, the, that uh, the US would be initiating an, a dialogue with Asian countries and would be in a listening mode. And he said very clearly that this is not something that the US has done well in the past and they recognize that. And they're going to be looking for um, ways of putting forward alternatives to Beijing. In other words, to collectively uh, developing some, uh, an approach that uh, multiple nations can, can buy into that can then be put to Beijing as opposed to uh, Beijing basically telling us where, what, what we should be doing in multilateral organizations. Having said that, um, he also said that one of the, their objectives is to, to uh, convey to Asian countries that the, the era of U.S. dynamism is not over, that the U.S. has not lost its democracy. And uh, so it's a bit of a, a, a clarification, I think. And then finally, he noted that China is uh, is good at splitting up alliances uh, where they feel that nations are collectively forming against them and that that's something that um, the Asia Pacific, the Indo-Pacific and the D10 would have to be w watching for. Okay, thanks so much, Margaret. Uh, really interesting. And I think also uh, an area that our audience is very interested in. So, you know, once we finish the moderated discussion, we might get back into this and also the US uh, role. I think the Alaska talks as well were very interesting and I would encourage uh, those who are interested in this issue not just to read the reports or the analysis of this but actually to read the script of those uh, those uh, opening remarks is really instructive and you know I have heard also reports that there were some mistranslations here and there but nonetheless uh, please do uh, take the chance to to read the script of of the, the opening remarks of both the US and the Chinese side. I think it's really um, interesting and I think foreshadows potentially uh, what we might be seeing in the coming months in that relationship. Uh, I'd like to move on next uh, on the trade side. And uh, you know, I'll start uh, with Rohan and then uh, I'll ask Jeff to kind of uh, give us some insights on this too. Um, Rohan, you referenced uh, everyone's favorite acronym that we always mess up, the, the CPTPP uh, or the 11, um, you know, which Canada is a part of, um, you know, it wasn't always the easiest process to get there, but we're, we're there now. Um, and uh, how are Canadian businesses in the region, uh, and in particular in the ASEAN region, where you're based, uh, how are they reacting to this, uh, this new trade deal? Um, and uh, I'm not sure how much, um, you know, you're engaged in this part, but, you know, has it delivered uh, so far on the promises uh, and of opportunities that, uh, that I think it committed to? Uh, has the pandemic had any impact on this um, in, in order to kind of see how, how effective the TPP-11 has been? Uh, and I guess a last kind of question on this uh, is, are there ways to complement this, uh, the TPP efforts? Uh, is there need for more kind of bilateral deals in the region? Um, should we feel missions accomplished now because we're a member of the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership? Or, you know, I like your, your stock taking from a private sector perspective. Um, on this. And then Jeff, please feel free to kind of add your thoughts on the, the TPP-11 afterwards. Uh, sure, uh, Jonathan. Uh, well, firstly, we can thank uh, Canada for the CP component of the CPTPP. I think TPP was uh, a little easier uh, previously, but uh, we'll work with CPTPP. And uh, 
you know, to your first question, uh, has there been uh, immediate effects felt in you know, primarily the Southeast Asian region? Uh, yes, they have. Um, I think Canadian businesses investing here um, have felt a bit more reassured by some of the, um, the guidelines about uh, transparency around law enforcement for investment deals and, uh, you know, how the judiciary in countries like you know, Vietnam, which is a very dynamic economy in this region and is seeing a lot of Canadian investment across uh, many sectors, I think that's been one uh, component and one benefit. Um, and the second thing is it uh, really, I think, set the tonality or the spirit of um, uh, you know, free trade and more open trade in this region. And that got conversations moving at a lot more fluid pace. So you've got CPTPP and you've got businesses looking for edges. Um, you know, we saw a lot of Canadian exports in agri to Vietnam, to Japan. Uh, take off shortly thereafter. I mean, these were two countries that were really on the ball um, with regards to engaging their business communities with the benefits. Um, but that spirit of opening up free trade um, has allowed for more bilateral discussions because some countries um, are like, you know, I won't name them, but they're like, okay, we're not part of it, but we still want to be a part of the overall spirit of the opening up of markets. So there are bilateral conversations happening with Canada at the local level. Um, and at the same time, uh, we, we're also seeing more uh, countries looking at Canada as an investment destination uh, to set up their supply chains, their manufacturing. Um, so the operating phrases are looking at, it still will take some time, but I think overall it's moving in a direction where there will be more trade and investment flows uh, as a result of it. And we're seeing some immediate export results, uh, specifically into Vietnam and uh, Japan. Okay, that's excellent. Thanks, Rohan. Uh, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on the, the TPP-11 and um, what might be the way forward? Yeah, I think this is a, you know, a critical trade agreement for Canada. I mean, in many ways, Canada, uh, you know, competes for very similar products uh, as the U.S. in the Indo-Pacific. And the CPTPP, uh, by virtue of us being a member and they are not, gives us a first mover advantage that we need to capitalize on. And so to some extent, we've been doing that, particularly in agri-food. I think we're seeing really good uh, progress there. So things like uh, meat products are uh, doing very well in countries like Japan and elsewhere. And I think, you know, Canada, with the help of the Trade Commissioner Service and and others uh, really need to work fast and hard to lock in the gains and establish reputation, reliable supplier of high quality products, um, because the U.S. is going to be back. Now, most people don't expect they're going to rejoin the CPTPP anytime soon, if ever. But they are talking now about set, doing sectoral trade deals with countries in the Indo-Pacific. And I can certainly see agri-food being uh, at the top of the list. So while we still have this first mover advantage, I think this is something that uh, Canada can, needs to continue uh, to build on. I think that's a really crucial point that you just referenced. Uh, you know, uh, it, in many ways, it's a million dollar question whether um, the U.S. will return to the TPP. As you said, I don't think it's something in the, in the near term that will happen. Uh, but the reality is, I think, in trade terms and the way that it approaches trade in the region, it will it, it will change. And I think the rhetoric already has changed. Um, so I think uh, while the uh, strike, while the iron is hot in many ways, and while we have this kind of comparative advantage, we need to uh, make sure that we seize those opportunities. Um, Excellent. Uh, I, I just uh, will abuse this position one uh, more time and ask one last question, which I think is a real fundamental and important question that many of you sort of hinted at in your in your remarks and a little bit in this moderated discussion. Uh, and this is on um, resources for such a strategy. So I think Stephen and Margaret and others have, have talked about this. Um, obviously, Canada has shown a push to be more engaged. Uh, we know that uh, you know the government's also looking at, at the Indo-Pacific region and looking at developing an approach or strategy for this. Um, we know that the Prime Minister has referenced uh, a couple times uh, his interest in the free and open Indo-Pacific. But how possible is this from a resource perspective? Uh, does Canada, frankly, have the resources to have that sustainable? A consistent and evolving sort of approach as as Stephen I think first referenced in his opening comment. Uh, 
Uh, and the sort of the second uh, end of that question is how will this impact uh, our uh, pre-existing engagements? So obviously, you know, a member of the transatlantic security community, our commitments to NATO, and in many senses, uh, uh, those commitments, including commitments to NORAD as well, actually in a continental sense, um, will continue to keep incurring more costs. Um, is there, is there, are there the resources uh, to to fund such a push to the Indo-Pacific? So uh, maybe I will start with Stephen uh, on this. I'd like everyone actually to to have a very brief comment on this. Uh, so start with Stephen. I, I look at this a, a couple different ways, and I think one of the challenges for Canadi Canada is the lack of policymakers and scholars and thinkers that are thinking about Canada within the Indo-Pacific. So I think we need to invest resources in building the expertise so that we can start crafting um, different um, walkways or to be able to engage within the region. I think this is really, really, really critical. The next generation of policymakers need to be not just Japan focused or China focused or South Korea focused, but they must have a country focus as well as a, a region, uh, understand that country and the region. Um, so that, that's in terms of human capital, and that's really critical. Um, but again, I, I would like to go back to the point about how we distribute our resources. And I think this is where we think about capabilities and we think about where we can bolt in. So pre-existing institutions such as the Quad, how can we attach ourselves to that and lend our capabilities, whether it's intelligence gathering or otherwise? And where can we use some of our comparative advantages such as diplomacy or uh, pre our, our, you know, our, our first mover footprint in the CPTPP to um, advocate for more members? So again, using our comparative advantages, using our diplomacy. So I, I, I look at how we can use our resources from the standpoint of we need to develop more human capital to engage in the region and we need to think smartly about which capabilities and comparative advantages that we can use to bolt in or um, again use those diplomacies that diplomacy to engage within the region where we're already where we have a good footprint already okay thanks so much Stephen. Uh, rohan uh, do you have any thoughts on this on the resources required to engage here uh, 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 whether it's something that uh, how, how this will impact uh, our other engagements? Yeah, absolutely, Jonathan. Um, well, firstly, it does not have to be uh, the government taking the onus onto itself, uh, maybe alluding to my earlier remarks. Uh, it's a burden that can be shared with the private sector. I know the Trade Commissioner Service has been very good at uh, resourcing initiatives to build uh, business to business connections in their respective markets. I'm using Singapore as an example, but I know it's across. Um, the, uh, the region. Uh, and we also have individual private sector leaders who are traveling across the Indo-Pacific. They might be headquartered in Singapore, but they might fly off to Japan. This is again, pre-pandemic. And I, I know I didn't touch on your question about the pandemic and CPTPP. I'll get to that in a second. But pre-pandemic, uh, these folks were flying all across the region, building connections and you know representing Brand Canada for some of Canada's largest companies. And if they have in the back of their minds a notion that they are representing the country's uh, capabilities or representing the country in some way, uh, I think a lot of the diplomatic burden uh, and other uh, policy burdens can be shared with them to further Canada's interests across the markets uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and you know, the pandemic did interrupt that flow of travel across the region. Um, but uh, I really think that uh, they are one very well-resourced group of um, players uh, who can uh, really help Canada's uh, brand standing uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Thanks so much, Rohan. That's a great insight. Uh, Margaret. Yes, I love this question um, because it's so important. My first uh, assignment as an assistant deputy minister was at Department of Finance for five years. And even when we were in surplus, we were not properly funding our international uh, obligations and opportunities. And so I think that uh, with an Indo-Pacific strategy, it would have to be an all of government strategy where uh, each department had their own uh, roles and, and uh, deliverables that would have an Indo-Pacific dimension. And I, in my opening remarks, I, I looked at the sweep of the kinds of things that we can be doing in the Indo-Pacific. If we're not doing that, 
we shouldn't do it at all because uh, we have to sustain it. This is the one thing that uh, countries uh, tell us in that region is uh, Canada's there for one trip and then we don't hear from you for a while and then you're back again. And it has to be consistent, it has to be resourced and it has to be protected. And when I say protected, I'm concerned about our long-term uh, deficit. Uh, it's it's uh, enormous, as we all know, and there are good reasons why we have it. And I'm concerned that in the long term, if we're making a commitment to, to the Indo-Pacific, we have to protect the budget for that as there are pressures to start to reduce our deficit. Uh, thank you very much, Margaret. I think, I, you know, really excellent takeaways. I mean, the idea of you know, being consistent uh, resource, but also like long term. So when thinking about this region, rather than sort of um, approaching this as a project or a five year project and saying uh, we're attaching this envelope of money for five years. So we're so we're good with the Indo Pacific and then we'll move on somewhere else. I think this is this needs to be a long term um, commitment. Um, and part of that is resourcing in financial terms, but I think part of that is resourcing um, and uh, funding the emergence of new experts and many things that Stephen and, and others have referenced. So um, really excellent comments. Jeff, uh, please, uh, you have the last word on this. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm kind of with Margaret on this one. Um, speaking from my experience in government, I think if there's going to be an Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, it's going to need to be not only adequately resourced, but also coordinated uh, across government, because this is the kind of strategy that cuts across the various silos that we have in, in the various departments and so on. And I can just think of two critically important ones right now as Global Affairs and, and Natural Resources Canada, for example. Um, you know, these two are going to need to work closely together. And I would add the provincial governments that we should be leveraging the resources of the provinces, which have in many cases international offices, they have budgets and staff dedicated to trade development and international work. So I think, you know, uh, in tandem with implementing an Indo-Pacific strategy, there needs to be some kind of prioritization and perhaps reallocation of resources in government, but also, uh, you know, a comprehensive matrix of links uh, across the government and a way of managing this sort of cross cross government initiative, which is very complex, hard to pull off, but uh, is going to be very important uh, to do. And uh, finally, I would say, you know, um, we should look at some of these organizations that we have in the in the government. And I'll I'll give you one example: FinDev Canada. Uh, could be uh, potentially a very important partner in terms of stimulating investment in various areas, including energy and so on in the Indo-Pacific. But right now their mandate is strictly on Africa and the Caribbean, and they have no, uh, you know, no mandate in the Indo-Pacific for some reason. So these are the kinds of things that need to be looked at. And uh, so, uh, and I think uh, as Rohan indicated, working with provinces in, in, in the private sector is going to be an important part of this. Thanks so much, Jeff, and uh, and thanks to all. I mean, I think an excellent sort of final point there on the need for coordination, you know, both within the federal government, I think within um, within the provinces. And, uh, and one of the uh, interesting points that I think a couple of you mentioned was that, you know, this burden or this opportunity of this engagement um, from a resource perspective uh, need not fall only on the lines of, of one department um, in the federal government or even the federal government itself. Um, this is something that can be done, uh, complemented the track one in addition to uh, the private sector, as Rohan said, it's been had a traditional engagement in this region. But also, I think from the uh, the academic think tank uh, intellectual sector, as uh, Stephen referenced, um, there are uh, there are a few, um, you know, uh, more than a few, but uh, not enough uh, experts who who look at this region um, who are Canadian. But the idea of cultivating more talent, especially uh, from the young and emerging networks, I think is a really important priority uh, for Canada going forward. Uh, and the idea of coordination, I think, is crucial. So it's easy to kind of you know say, well, we need all of these different. Uh, factors of society to kind of uh, work together for an Indo-Pacific strategy, but coordination is really important. And I think that gets to the point, and, um, and I should make a short plug for uh, our briefing series that we also have 
uh, attached to this webinar series. And, and please look out for, for a couple of briefs that are gonna be coming out. One's gonna be coming out on the Korean Peninsula and another one on this topic, um, which I've written. Uh, and one of the points I argue is the need to appoint a, a high level coordinator uh, within the federal government um, to sort of deal with some of these challenges. So uh, it shouldn't be left on the doorstep of only one department. Obviously, a lot of departments are going to be doing some extremely heavy lifting with this. Uh, but I think there's a need for a very high level appointment of a, of, of a coordinator to deal with this and also to engage with uh, our most uh, trusted partners and friends uh, in this region. Uh, so that's, a, that's an excellent uh, way to segue now to uh, the um, Q&A. And we have a lot of interesting ones. So I don't know if we're going to be able to get through them all. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to start with one again that kind of uh, hits on Canada's approach to this region, um, and we had one of our panelists, uh, sorry, one of our um, audience members who asked. Uh, he uh, he said uh, Canada has no official uh, Indo-Pacific vision or strategy at the moment. Um, uh, but while we are in the process of developing this strategy or approach, um, which uh, model should we be looking at? So of the different partners, I think we've referenced a few of them today, Japan, um, Australia, India, the United States, ASEAN also has an outlook, as many of our European friends have uh, have approaches to the region. Um, you know, which one, or is it a combination of, of a few that we should be looking at when we approach this? And sort of um, connect it to this question, uh, is there uh, one sort of state actor, one relationship in this region that, we, that we've sort of dropped the ball with? Is there, is there one um, partner here that we just have not effectively engaged with, uh, that we should be engaging much more deeply with and, and could be a backbone of our uh, strategy in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, so if I can start with uh, Stephen uh, on this. So I, I think Jonathan, you know, there's, the, the the Netherlands, the Germans, the French, uh, of course, the United States and the Japanese have all put forward some version of an Indo-Pacific uh, guideline or vision or strategy. Um, I think this, the vision that probably most aligns with what Canada is interested in is, is probably what we see coming out of Japan um, that focuses on a free and open Indo-Pacific context. Uh, its core pillar really is promoting a rules-based order within the region. Um, although Japan is much bigger than Canada in terms of its overall power, I think it behaves as what we call middle power, trying to buttress international institutions and rules-based behavior um, in trade and in, in, mar in the maritime domain. So I think that identity and the focus on free and open and rules-based order from a normative standpoint is probably something that resonates with Canada very, very much. Uh, a second aspect I think that's important in the Canadian context or in the Japanese context is that it's not solely focused on security, infrastructure, connectivity, the digital economy, um, and promoting a rules-based order within the maritime domain, uh, promoting economic integration. And now um, we've seen um, diversification of supply chains, as well as working within the quadrilateral uh, uh, framework to provide uh, a boosting of vaccine productions and distribution. So what we see is the Japanese model really evolving according to needs within the region, but it's not solely security focused. And I think it presents a lot of, it presents a template for Canada, but not necessarily the exact recipe that will reflect Canadian interests. And here, I think that's really important that we ultimately look at what are Canadian interests within the region. But I think the template that comes out of Japan is, is a pretty good start to focus on. Okay, thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, Margaret. Yes, uh, I, I would completely buy into that analysis. And um, I think the US too is seeing uh, a congruence there between their approach and the Japanese approach. But, uh, but yes, I think the Japanese approach is, is the right one. I have seen some analysis that suggests that we should be going in a quite a different direction, uh, almost an anti-US uh, approach. Um, but I think that's dated. And I think you know, that that's uh, looking at Trump and, uh, and saying he's a, um, you know, not dependable. Uh, we have a very different American uh, administration in charge. And uh, so I think that working in tandem with Japan and the US, we should be very well placed to uh, have a complementary um, 
uh, strategy to their own uh, and one that is truly Canadian. Thanks, that's excellent. Uh, Jeff Rohan, uh, Jeff, did you have uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, I just, I think I agree with, with everything that's been said and uh, you know, it's important for Canada to work with with partners and um, you know, Japan and the US are gonna be key um, because they seem to be most aligned with where our interests would be in the region uh, in terms of trade and security. And in the broader context, I think FOIP is, uh, a, is a kind of a, uh, a framework that Canada could easily buy into. It's not anti-China, it's not just security focused. Uh, it does have trade, security, and a broader context to it, uh, and it could be expanded. So it's something I think Canada should uh, pursue further. Thank you very much. Rohan, did you have any thoughts on this point? Yeah, very briefly, I'll, I'll be a bit parochial, uh, Jonathan, and say Canada could do um, more with Singapore. Um, I'm in Singapore, and uh, the reason I say that is Canada is already doing a lot uh, in terms of on-the-ground engagement. Uh, but I think from an institutional level, uh, there are no direct flights between Canada and Singapore. Uh, it's a well-run democracy, like-minded part of the Commonwealth. And uh, they have a wonderfully nuanced approach to balancing diplomatic considerations between the US, China, the EU, Japan, and the other players. And I think that nuanced approach, I, I just you know watch it in admiration from a distance uh, and, and read about it. But I think uh, there are, are a lot of insights that uh, Canada could gain from Singapore's approach, and uh, maybe we could start with some uh, direct flights once uh, travel resumes. Well, thank you. I agree. I mean, Singapore is a very important country in the region and a very important country for Canada. And I mean, one of the, the things we haven't had the chance to kind of get into the discussion on, but you know, as important as the engagement with ASEAN as an institution is and in, you know, Southeast Asia as a region, I think it's also important to individually through member states uh, and some of those relationships that we have uh, more uh, longstanding ties, such as Singapore, I think it's important to kind of to cultivate those relationships as much as we can. Um, and I, you know, fully agree on uh, the points that many of you reference on Japan. Um, uh, one of our uh, the members of our senior advisory council, uh, uh, Richard Fadden, and former Canadian National Security Advisor, I think recently made an excellent point at the Ottawa conference um, here. Um, and when talking about the Indo-Pacific, that it sort of baffles him that, that Canada-Japan strategic engagement is sort of not being taken advantage of uh, in, in the way that it should be. So I think that that, um, that is one relationship that I think uh, should be uh, progressed. Um, okay, well, I, I wanted to uh, move on to another question. This is an interesting one, too, that one of our audience members asked. Uh, about the specific roles uh, for the diaspora. So Canada's sort of Asian diaspora community in building up this strategy, this relationship with the region. Um, you know, how or should they be mobilized for this task, for this strategy? Um, you know, what is the role of, of, uh, of the Asian diasporas within Canada and how should we incorporate this into a strategic approach? Um, I don't know if, uh, Margaret, do you have thoughts on this uh, first? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, this is a very important question because it's a huge asset to Canada that we have uh, such a deep diaspora from most of these countries, perhaps all. And uh, that's something we can build on through consultations, through networks, through events, through missions. Um, it's something that they should be engaged in. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if there is an Indo Pacific strategy announced, to what extent has there been consultation with those diaspora and will the, or is that built into the strategy going forward? I hope it is. Okay, great. Uh, Rohan, do you have any thoughts on this point? Uh, yeah, absolutely, John. I mean, uh, you jump into a cab in Singapore or India or Vietnam or Indonesia, um, there's always somebody who has a relative or who studied in Canada uh, and, uh, you know, they know enough about Canada. So uh, I'm not sure about mobilizing um, the diaspora or Canadians with connections to this region. I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, but the reality is a lot of people have very um, subtle uh, but strong ties to Canada. And um, usually they never talk about it. You can go into a room in Singapore and half of them will be Canadian citizens, but you couldn't tell because of, you know, our multicultural uh, ethos. But once you tap them on the shoulder and say, you know, are you 
able to help us out with something Canadian related, you know, people's eyes light up. And uh, so there is that, that passion there. I think it's a matter of proactively tapping people on the shoulder with whatever, you know, policy objectives might be the case or the priorities might be at that time. Uh, because, you know, our Canada days across this region are filled with people that we often never see for the rest of the year. Um, so, yeah, the dias diaspora definitely uh, could be important. And, of course, there are family businesses that operate uh, in multiple countries with regards to relatives uh, in this region uh, and relatives in Canada, which I think also uh, can be uh, leveraged with regards to capital flows. Definitely. That's a really important point. I think, I mean, when we talk about diaspora, Canada's connection to the region, I think it's it's uh, on two sides. Uh, obviously, it's um, those living here in Canada, but also uh, Canadians living abroad. And I, you know, I agree with you. We're a little bit away from the days of uh, everyone having a maple leaf on their backpack. It, it was always so easy to go identify Canadians abroad, um, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But now it's, it's kind of hard to uh, to notice all the Canadian expatriates. There's so many of them in the region. Um, Excellent points. Uh, Stephen, did you have a, any thoughts on this question? It's a delicate topic. And I think, um, you know, the Indo-Pacific region has many different countries and backgrounds and the diaspora that comes from the different countries uh, have different dynamics. But um, I think that the new national security law in China, um, we don't know what are the boundaries of where it can be enforced. And I think that it could disenchant many, many um, Canadians of Chinese backgrounds to uh, get on board or support openly Indo-Pacific vision. So, um, and I think that we've seen it backfire in terms of you know the Indian diaspora and how it's created challenges between India and Canada um, with, I think, not well-considered engagement in India. So I think any kind of leveraging of, of um, Canadian or a diaspora from the region really needs to be well-considered. Um, and we need to be very knowledgeable about the internal dynamics and politics in those countries so that we can um, best leverage those skills, um, but of course, uh, not put those individuals in, in, in a dif difficult position. Okay, that's great. Uh, Jeff, uh, did you have any quick thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I, I'm most interested in actually the Canadians abroad because I think in many cases, uh, Canadians living as expats in other countries are, you know, learning local languages, understanding, trying to understand local culture, in some cases are doing business. They may be members of the local Canadian chamber or some kind of friends, friendship association or whatever. So they have some connections socially, culturally, business-wise, some language and cultural uh, experience and capability. These people should be leveraged uh, much more than uh, they are, although there are some excellent examples of where they have been engaged and have really helped uh, Canada's uh, efforts. Uh, as far as the diaspora in Canada is concerned, you know, certainly the first generation immigrants are still maintaining some connections with their countries they've left. And in some cases, like Rohan, I think, said, uh, family businesses are ongoing, but once you get into second, third generation, um, they become Canadian and then we're sort of, they're like every other Canadian. Um, we still need to provide the resources to help uh, people, um, you know, do uh, support international trade and so on. So I, I'm quite interested in the Canadians abroad. 